Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to day two of West, day two of our Information Warfare Pavilion's slate of activities, and day two of our IW Speaker Series. Uh, we've got four great speakers lined up for today, um, and so hopefully for a lot of good engagement between you and our speakers. And I'm delighted that the first one that's going to come up is our IBOSS, the Information Warfare Community Lead. Vice Admiral Kelly Ashback, who is the Commander, Naval I Information Forces, Information Warfare Forces. She's a graduate of GW University, came up through the ROTC program, a career intelligence officer. Her operational and, and staff assignments are far too many for me to read off to you in this amount of time we want to give her. Um, but uh, she's really ready to talk to you about where our forces are headed and the biggest asset in our information warfare toolkit, our people. So Admiral, over to you. Hey, thanks, it's great to be here. It's great to see so many uh, familiar faces and a lot of new faces. And uh, so first, my thanks to AFSIA International and uh, the United States Naval Institute for sponsoring this event, uh, which uh, clearly, once again, I think is exceeding expectations. It was fantastic to be back last year after a couple of years of uh, COVID impacts. And uh, this year uh, is turning out to be really special in terms of uh, the number of folks who are participating. So thanks to all of you who made time to be here, um, particularly our industry partners. Uh, is, this is, for us, the premier information warfare event uh, during the year. And so we really value the opportunity we get to talk to all of you. Um, and then I just want to personally extend my thanks to all my IW leaders, all my IW organizations that are in, uh, in here. Uh, they're working displays. They're in the engagement zones. Uh, they're supporting the speaker series. Uh, I should have wisely actually signed up to speak first because I think uh, some of the speakers yesterday are more fascinating than I'm going to be uh, here with you this morning. Um, but we have a great lineup, uh, and hopefully you have the chance uh, to hear it, frankly, directly from the folks who are uh, uh, forward, operating in it, uh, and really advancing information warfare for us. And I would put a plug in also for Navy Postgraduate School, where we have fantastic IW students uh, and others to talk to. So there is also uh, capability and, and people around the pavilion outside of our IW concentration area. So we have infiltrated, we are everywhere, uh, and we hope we have a chance uh, to talk to you while you're here. So uh, I'm not going to talk for very long this morning. I really want to preserve uh, most of the time for a dialogue with you and, and frankly address what's on your mind. Uh, but I will spend a few minutes and uh, my effort this morning, I'm going to focus on my hat as the type commander. Many of you know that I am the head of the information warfare community, but I wasn't going to focus this morning on community business. I'm happy to take questions. I know in the cyber area in particular, uh, there's a lot of interest and I'm certainly happy to address that and the questions if that comes up. But what I really wanted to talk about today uh, and the value of why we're here uh, is about my type commander hat, about my role as the IBOS and what we do from a man, train, equip and readiness perspective uh, for our forces. And so as you all know, uh, part of why you're here, we are in a world of fleet and joint ops and that's at all levels of war. And I am sincere that in every forum where I'm asked what my biggest challenge is, it's that we are in demand, in demand that we cannot pace. Uh, and that is a really good problem to have, uh, but it does stress us in terms of the fact that we were already high demand, low density in many of our skill sets. And we remain that way in the additive skills that we're bringing across uh, information warfare. Uh, and so we do have to be really thoughtful about what is our integration uh, with our operational force to ensure that we maximize the impact we have in the most important areas uh, for our Navy. And so we have been growing capabilities and frankly shifting capabilities. Many of you are familiar with the information warfare commander concept. Uh, we did have, I think, Captain Tony Butera here in the pavilion last year talking about his personal experience on deployment as an information warfare commander. And that is well integrated in our strike group operations now. We've had tremendous success with our IW leaders who go out and perform the duties as the warfare commander and ensure that information uh, is leading all of the operations. And I'll be candid with you in my world, in my vision, when people ask me, you know, how do we know when we've really succeeded in information warfare and in each of our specialties, we set the table. 
And I, I tell folks, when you're sitting in a Warfare Commanders Conference and you've got all the assets available to you, most of you will know based on history that they look at the Desron and they ask, where does the Desron want to put the ships? They look at the CAG and ask, where do you want to put the uh, aircraft? Uh, they look at the sea carrier CO and the, and the cruiser that's providing uh, air defense and are like, well, where do you guys want to be? Then they turn to Information Warfare and they say, what can you do with that, with that array? You know, now that we've put everything in those places, what can you bring us? In my world, we would set the table first. You turn to the Information Warfare Commander and say, where do we need to put everything to optimize battle space awareness, assured communication, and integrated fires? We make that proposal, and if we make that proposal, the other warfare commanders could put their feet up on the table. Uh, they could sit back and relax because uh, we, would keep them, we would keep everybody in competition. We would not, uh, we would not need to do the rest of the work uh, that we spend time on. And I overstate that, but I think many of you um, know uh, that that's how powerful what we do is. If we do our jobs right, we will stay in competition. Uh, and I think that, that is, uh, that's becoming increasingly recognized and we're fully embraced at the table. Uh, but if we continue to make progress, we will go first and we will have uh, tactical control of many assets, manned and unmanned, in order to prioritize what we deliver from an information uh, perspective. The other area where we've made progress in the last year, I talked about it last year, but in amphibious ready groups, we also have information warfare commanders. We are fully partnered with the Marines on where they're going in terms of information. They now have their own information warfare command, uh, and we are aligned on how do we ensure uh, that we maximize what we both bring to the fight. And we had really great success with the, uh, the recent uh, ARG deployment up in the Baltic, uh, where they really had an opportunity to exploit opportunity from an information perspective and demonstrate what, demonstrate what the combined Blue Navy team can do. So that was really powerful. On submarines, we've been piloting IW officers and IW sailors full time on submarines. And I just uh, met with Almo Houston last week to review our success on that pilot, where we have uh, two submarines that have uh, IW officers and three sailors, three IW sailors each. Uh, and so successful uh, that they are going to commit to invest full time, probably, and at least two cryptologic uh, technician, uh, technicians to be on board to do EW. And we're going to start uh, building out an officer base so we have a full-time IW junior officer uh, on board submarines. Uh, and so really powerful, I think, and a recognition there of how complex the under undersea environment is, that we all benefit if we allow information warfare uh, experts to come and do their job full-time and support undersea experts who need to focus full-time on operating their submarine uh, in a very competitive uh, environment. And then in terms of uh, aviation and airborne, we're partnered very closely with uh, the Airbus right now on Triton. And so we are moving out to understand what does information warfare wholeness look like when we do unmanned uh, at scale. Uh, and I would tell you, we still have some work to do there, but a lot we're gonna learn uh, about how we deliver that capability and then how we do uh, processing, exploitation, and dissemination across a globally federated architecture of analysts, uh, which I think is really exciting. Uh, but we're going to have to work hard to make sure it's most effective and that, again, we prioritize against what's most important uh, for our fleet commanders. And then the big news, and I think uh, Admiral Mike Vernazza is today or tomorrow talking to you, uh, but uh, the Fleet uh, Information Warfare Command Pacific, um, that was established a year ago and huge for us uh, in terms of how we move forward on the integration of information warfare at the operational level. Almo Paparo mentioned it briefly yesterday during his uh, keynote during the lunch, but incredibly powerful in getting after his information warfare line of effort, which I remind people, if you've seen his campaign for the Pacific and his lines of effort, the IW line of effort, it's a giant arrow that runs under everything else. None of the other pillars or lines of effort can succeed without it, which again demonstrates uh, how vital we are. But I also think that that work out there and the fact that Amal Vernaza is dual-hatted as the Director for Maritime Information Warfare in the MOC is probably the most powerful aspect of the concept and is going to inform what we do at all the other numbered fleets uh, and MOC level in terms of IW integration, where we really need to commit to a construct so that the IBOS and the rest of IW can align in delivering the best capability. Uh, and we're on that path. So uh, I'm almost 
two years into my tenure in this job, and last year as I approached the one-year mark, working with my staff um, and uh, recognizing the demand, we did undertake a realignment inside of Naval Information Forces uh, to frankly, uh, hopefully be more effective in the work that we're doing to support the fleet. And many of you may recall that when we were established back in 2014, we uh, organized functionally. We had what were called mission readiness teams. Uh, and our initial concept was that we were very much focused on the operational shore commands and we would organize by type of command. So we had an intel desk, we had a cyber desk, we had a comms desk, a uh, weather desk or ocean desk. And, uh, and that actually initially was somewhat effective for us. Um, but like many things that happen, at least have happened in my career, um, we, weren't, uh, we weren't very effective at predict predicting the trajectory uh, that we would be on uh, as an information warfare community. Uh, and our focus initially just on the operational shore commands woefully underestimated uh, the demand uh, for information warfare readiness and TICOM advocacy across the fleet. And so when we were established as a TICOM, we didn't have the information warfare commander. We were providing direct support afloat, but we now are in the business of ensuring that our information warfare commanders are manned, trained, and equipped. We need a readiness model and a focus on how to take care of them. We also didn't anticipate the rise of the maritime operations centers, and in an awesome way, our NICTAMs and our NCTSs, the vital role they play in NC3 and in assured communications. And last year, OBNAV designated that group uh, as something called C3, which uh, essentially, they've been designated as platform equivalent. And we're on a path with OBNAV and NAVWAR right now to build out permanent system, sustainment, modernization, and planning modeled after all the great work we've done for years on platforms. But that also requires a little bit different TICOM engagement and support in order for us to be most effective. And if you add in that there was not a TICOM for the mock until a few months ago, we are taking on uh, all those operations centers and their systems of systems, the advocacy we do for the capability they need to e execute at the operational level of war. And then the last piece of it was we still had our shore commands, uh, which are doing exceptional work. Mission has grown. And we added the cyber mission force. We didn't have the cyber mission force when we established uh, the type command. And the cyber mission force, I think, has surprised us uh, in the readiness demands. How do you do force generation for teams of people and sustain what's required uh, to prevail uh, and defeat on the net? Uh, and that is very demanding. And to cyber command's credit, they have established a very rigorous readiness model uh, and candidly, Navy was not keeping pace with it when I got into the job. And so we've had to lean in there on how uh, we come up with our own effective force generation model, uh, learning a lot from that and how that extends to the rest of the shore enterprise. Um, so as a result of that, we reorganized ourselves into three pillars. And we now, instead of these uh, mission readiness teams, I now have an information uh, warfare readiness directorate that I think Tammy North talked to you about yesterday. They have three pillars. They are focused to float. They're focused to shore. Uh, and the shore piece is basically broken into the two pillars. One is these mock uh, C3 commands. Uh, and then the other one is all the rest of the shore and the cyber mission force. And then as I've, I've mentioned to you, our mission keeps growing. So we've been wrestling with, well, where does Triton fit in that? You know, where do we put unmanned inside that portfolio? Uh, what do we do with space uh, while we're growing out space capability? Uh, and so I would anticipate that if we're a good staff and we are fully integrating the principles of get real, get better, uh, we will self-assess uh, that we're probably going to have to modify our construct again uh, to remain adaptive and agile and supporting uh, all the forces uh, that need our help. And then in terms of where we're focused on readiness, uh, my highest priority has been on training uh, and that I do think um, we are not at our best in the training we're providing for our information warriors. Uh, we have a lot of good stuff in place, uh, but we do not move fast enough, nearly fast enough to pace all the capability we're delivering. Uh, our brick and mortar construct uh, has a lot of trouble keeping up with the agility with which uh, industry and others now are delivering fantastic uh, capabilities. Uh, and so we have had to lean in on how do we do better with training, 
one of the first moves I made last year was when I came into the job, Naval Information Forces still wasn't responsible for all of IW training. Uh, and our history was that IW training was delivered by the other type commanders uh, because we didn't have a Nav I-4. And when we stood up, we took some of that training on board, but somehow we got stalled. And when I came on board, we still weren't doing intel training, we weren't doing comms training, and we have since fixed that alignment. So I think in a really powerful way now, my team is held accountable for the quality and the caliber of IW training that's delivered afloat. We also have a very powerful construct now with Ready Relevant Learning, where Al Mokadil has clearly signaled that the TICOM is the decider on requirements and changes to training down at CWIT. Uh, and so we've got a great relationship and partnership with them uh, that allows us to drive prioritization and hopefully more responsiveness in the nature of the training we need. And then the other area that we've been focused on is the advocacy for live virtual constructive training. And my team has partnered with NAVWAR over the last year. I think we did eight pilots where we're trying to bring IW capabilities into the live virtual constructive environment. We've made uh, some good progress there, but not surprisingly, there are significant engineering challenges in uh, adapting all of our existing capabilities and getting it plugged in to the live virtual environment and replicated in a way that you can train to it. We also have been trying to break down the classification barrier and move everybody, not just information warfare, but all the warfighting domains to a TSSCI level so we can really maximize uh, the uh, presentation of the threat and make everything much more realistic for everyone. So we're making good progress there, but I would tell you I'm, I'm not by nature a patient person um, and, uh, and, and we're not moving fast enough. Uh, and I do advocate every time I get a forum and I think I drive uh, some of my bosses crazy with, if you could spend one more dollar on live virtual constructive, you would spend it on information warfare because it's the one area where you generally cannot really train to the capability you think is gonna keep you in competition or is gonna give you an edge if conflict uh, uh, erupts. Uh, and we guess on a lot of that right now. And, uh, and that's not a good thing. We might be right. We might actually be underestimating how powerful our effects could be. Uh, but my guess is in some areas we're probably wrong uh, and we have more work to do uh, to ensure that the capability is most effective or that the technique or tactic we've developed uh, is the right one uh, for employment of the capability. Uh, so we, uh, we are focused and leaning in uh, really hard uh, on that. Um, the other area that takes up a lot of my time, I mentioned the Cyber Mission Force. Uh, we are working hard there on lifting readiness and, uh, and really the most important takeaway from all of that is we have a force generation model for how you produce a team of people. Uh, and we are in the process of trying to make sure we move all the training, the foundational training to the left. So I know this shocks folks, but it, 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 I had to learn. We had to learn through Cyber Mission Force that you actually need to train an individual to do their job before they show up to do their job. We were not doing that with a cyber mission force. We were actually just sending people directly to the teams and then we were doing on the job training or trying to send them the training after the fact, which is not a good model. And so we are looking to lift and shift all that training to the left so they show up most ready. And then we're working on how do you remain a part of a team and keep team proficiency and certification at a really high level. Uh, and, uh, and we're leaning into that now. We're using persistent uh, cyber uh, training environment uh, to help us support the disaggregated force that comprises the cyber mission force. And I think there's a lot of great lessons there that we're gonna be able to apply um, to the rest of the commands and how we ensure that you get training before you arrive and then how we leverage um, architectures like PCTE uh, to deliver training on site uh, with agility uh, and in the most effective way. So you can actually train with your team. Uh, you get great individual training before you show up and then you get uh, really powerful uh, integrated training uh, once you're on site. So the, the last thing I, I want to uh, highlight before I open for questions is, uh, and this is a fair question we get every year uh, when we come here is, folks here, you all want to know how you can help us. Uh, and I would tell you first, you're helping us by partnering with us, you're here. And partnerships, I mentioned our people, partnerships are our other uh, competitive edge and are, what are really valuable to us. And that's across industry, that's across coalition, that's across services, et cetera. And so, uh, so that's the first thing is just, yeah, buy in on the partnership and the teaming. Uh, please, don't, please don't walk away. Uh, from an opportunity uh, to, uh, to share what you have. 
Um, but where we, we need additional help, though, is I've mentioned the training piece. And my observation is that on any type of training we're talking about, particularly when we're delivering new capability, we miss the mark every time in thinking about what's required to train a sailor or an officer to be self-sufficient on operations and maintenance. And we need help on that. The folks who build the equipment know it better than anybody else. And we owe a partnership in that on how we help build out the right curriculum, whether that's a, uh, a computer-based training curriculum, whether that's a schoolhouse curriculum, uh, whatever that's gonna be, we need to partner with you. But what's consistently happening is we get so focused on the acceleration of delivering the capability, we forget what's required um, to make the system whole. Uh, and we really need help in ensuring that you make us self-sufficient. We love the partnership. We're not saying we don't wanna work with you. But we need to know when we're cut off and operating in uh, distant places, especially when we're out on the ocean, that our sailor has been empowered and trained in a way that they've got almost everything they need to make sure something keeps operating and, uh, and that they can fix it. Uh, and we all, we're all better for it, especially as we progress up. Our talent moves back and forth, and so the more self-sufficient we are long-term, the richer we all are as a team together uh, in what we deliver. We also need software solutions. I mentioned that yesterday. Admiral Small may have talked about that yesterday. Um, but the direction we're going, just like everybody else, is we really can't afford to have you show up with a lot of hardware. Uh, we don't have the time. Uh, and uh, being in a yard period or having to hold still uh, to allow you to carry on a whole bunch of gear and figure out how we're going to plug it in uh, is really just not viable anymore. And so how uh, we get capability that is software uh, centric uh, and just can be added and loaded on to systems we already have on board is, uh, is really vital. I talked about live virtual constructive. If you're delivering anything new to us, make sure it's LVC ready. Uh, our existing uh, systems, we're trying to figure out how to get them in. Going forward, we'd like that to be solved up front. And so we're hopefully advocating that across uh, uh, all of our uh, program development. And then the last thing is uh, we all collectively need to avoid anything that's proprietary in terms of data and architecture. Uh, we have to be able to move stuff on the existing architecture. Uh, and it's got to be, uh, the data's got to be agnostic in a way that it can flow over any of that architecture, that we can recognize it, store it, and it can be moved uh, between systems. Uh, and, uh, and so um, our cooperative efforts on understanding the naval ar operational architecture what Admiral Small is doing with Project Overmatch, the DevSecOps, all of that is really vital uh, to where we're going and our future success. Um, so again, I want to thank all of you for being here this morning and thank you for your respective roles uh, in advancing uh, information warfare. And I'm happy to take uh, any questions. Morning, ma'am. Uh, Chief Johnson, San Jose. Um, hearing the talk about personnel, uh, especially in relation to commercial, you know, as a chief, we're always worried about retention just as much as we are recruiting. Uh, how are we looking right now as an information force? You know, we get sailors in, we get them, you know, trained up, qualified, and four years later they're out the door and heading off to a much larger salary out in, in the broader civilian community uh, with their top secret clearances, with all the certifications that we've given them. Mm -hmm. uh, how are we doing in that respect of of keeping good people in and or recruiting new talent from across the board, whether it's going to be active, reserve, bringing them into where we want them to be. Thank you, uh, ma'am. I'll start with recruiting. Um, recruiting is a really tough problem right now, and not just for information warfare. It, uh, it's actually across Department of Defense, all the services. Um, and for information warfare within, within inside the Navy, uh, candidly, we are uh, behind goal on a couple of our ratings, and they are the te really technically demanding ones. So I am concerned, like for CTN, uh, where we need a network cyber capability, uh, that we're not pacing the requirement uh, like we, you know, in the way we would like to. We've got a lot in motion uh, with Big Navy on how we do outreach and try to promote interest in the Navy. Um, I personally think once we get you through the door, um, if we deliver on good training and we get you as efficiently as we can out to uh, be an operator in whatever rating we've hired you into or designator, um, I think we actually stand a decent chance of retaining you for a while. Our, our retention, um, there is some fragility in our retention, um, but, uh, but it's not, we're not hemorrhaging people. Um, folks actually still find the work and the nature of what's going on in competition uh, really uh, rewarding. 
And, uh, and as I've discussed with folks, there are things the Navy does from a maritime perspective, particularly if you talk about our submarines, you can't get that experience anywhere else in the world. Uh, and so if we can get you to serve for 8, 10, 12 years, you know, whatever it is that we retain you for, uh, then that's a win. Um, I am concerned at our more senior ranks, 05, 06, we are seeing some pressure, particularly in cryptology and information professional right now, uh, where some folks are choosing to depart. Part of that is the fantastic job market right now where you can, yeah, you can get a very lucrative job of your choice. It's, I think, an employee's market kind of right now on you deciding where you want to go. Uh, because the job market is uh, so open. But I also think, again, some of that's on us, though. I think um, I'm hopeful that the decision that we've made on cyber, how we're moving out, some uh, relief on the cryptologic uh, designator in terms of allowing them to focus more purely on traditional mission sets um, might alleviate um, some of the angst or the pressure I think that the force was feeling in terms of the demands uh, and that again we're looking at uh, expanding the cryptologic training to 12 weeks we're trying to do more I think to help folks uh, feel better enabled uh, so that uh, when we do ask them to work hard that they feel like you know that they've gotten an investment in return uh, for uh, uh, for how we're uh, uh, grooming them so I do think uh, it's fragile but I would tell you officially our retention data shows uh, that we are pacing or outpacing the Navy average on retention right now but uh, but I am mindful that 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 uh, you've got to be careful on that judgment because we literally match bodies to bill it and generally you want to have more people than you actually have jobs for if you want to be successful uh, long term and then with our demand yeah every every person on the field or on a ship counts so uh, so great question yeah uh, morning, April. Uh, Paul Ross, Bolt from Systems Planning and Analysis. Could you talk a little more about uh, what you're doing with international partners and, in particular, what the challenges are and how you overcome them? Okay. Uh, so, we have a lot, uh, we're doing a lot of work through our Warfighting Development Center right now with our partners. Uh, we are working uh, with, uh, I'll give examples like Australia, Japan, uh, and United Kingdom. Uh, and I actually spoke to the foreign naval attaches about two weeks ago, and I want to say we have at least a dozen countries or so that are either establishing information warfare uh, programs uh, or are interested in partnering further in the information warfare realm. Uh, and so we are leaning in there. We are um, focused when we develop uh, concepts like the Information Warfare Commander or uh, CONOPS, we have a releasable version of that that we have made available so that our partners can benefit um, from the tactics and techniques that we've developed. Uh, and so we are leaning in because we do recognize the value and certainly having other countries in the same mission space be very powerful, particularly in the Pacific. Um, so very excited about where they're going uh, with that. There are challenges though, and, um, and candidly, the foreign attaches asked me on one of them, uh, uh, some of it is this concern about our vulnerability from a cyber perspective to competitors and the extent to which other folks are penetrated, where we've been exploited or information's been exfiltrated. Uh, and really, I think the delic delicacy of how we partner with folks to help them do better if we're concerned. And I also encourage them how they're candid with us if they're concerned or have a perception that maybe we're not as secure uh, as we need to be based on how things are portrayed in the media, et cetera. And I think we've got really good bilateral processes right now for how we're trying to work through that with different countries and make our techniques and training available if they're interested. And so, uh, so I think there's a lot of promise across the board there. Um, the only other thing I would say is um, the complexity though of uh, of multinational integration, uh, we still run into that problem where because we have varying degrees of uh, integration with different partners, when you try to level that across everybody, we do run into architecture challenges uh, still. And, um, and I don't know that there's easy answers to that. Um, trying to help the coalition pace where we're going, especially in terms of like crypto cryptographic modernization is really important, and, uh, and we certainly don't want to leave them behind, so uh, we continue to work on that as well. Good morning, ma'am. Everett Hayes from Lytos. Uh, I was going to ask, are, do you see artificial intelligence as a force multiplier for information warfare? Or do you see that as a, a way that you're going to be able to uh, possibly do more with less because of the proliferation of artificial intelligence in the commercial market? Yeah. Uh, I, 
I do see that um, artificial intelligence and machine learning, um, I have hope, like many, that uh, it could be a force multiplier for us. I don't see it as doing more with less. I actually see it as being more effective uh, with what we have. Uh, and that really, I, I was talking yesterday about the fact that if we get it right, we would free our people from mundane tasks. We could trust algorithms to do things right now where, you know, my background as an intel officer, we spent a lot of time over the years, like, personally searching, you know, counting on an image, you know, how many ships and submarines are actually there. And the more we can lean into uh, how we have ways to really point our analysts to what's most important and free them from much more complex thought about what does it actually mean, what should I do about it, I think it's really important. Um, we are doing some of that. I think there are tools that have been really powerful in uh, helping the analysts uh, accelerate how they get after stuff. Uh, but I do think the larger scaling, though, of AIML, we haven't really delivered um, in a really powerful way yet. And, uh, and there's a lot in motion. Some of that, too, is our own trust in, in uh, the idea that up to a certain point, an algorithm will decide for you. And then what do you know about the algorithm? Does it, does it continually make the right decision? How we find opportunities to practice that, I think, are really important. So I, I do think there's promise, um, but I, I, I am a little concerned that, and I used to say, my CIOs here, we used to talk about this with the cloud, that it, it, the, the promise of this thing and then the reality of, are we actually there yet? You know, and and I've, I've, Eric knows, I would say to him, all, are we in the cloud yet? We keep talking about the cloud, are we there? You know, is the cloud doing what we want the cloud to do? AIML is, uh, is kind of similar. Dr. Josh Quively from Nywick Pacific. Um, with information warfare being the newest of the warfighting domains, and because it's so new, it seems like there isn't a consensus on what exactly it is across the joint services. How would you define it, and is it important that we come to a common consensus on what it is to be able to work together? I think we need to have a common lexicon in order to be effective uh, in joint integration. But, but I would, I would say I don't, I don't consider information warfare itself a domain. Um, information warfare for us, information war fighting, is the integration of information capabilities. There are domains that we support or operate through, by, with, and through. Um, but I don't consider information warfare itself a domain. So, you know, you got cyber, space, you know, uh, you're under the sea, on the water, you know, in the air. Um, but when, when folks say domain, I don't really, I, I don't know that we're negotiating that with a joint force in terms of uh, what domain are we talking about. I do think that we are not all aligned on the full integration of all information related capabilities and the power that at least I think the Navy sees and how we do that. And even for us in the Navy, I would say that we still potentially have lessons we could learn from other services, where, for example, the Marine Corps integrates public affairs in their information approach. Uh, we have a very good relationship with the PAO, but we left that aspect out of our concept. So I do think we still need to continue to work with everyone on what's the right lexicon and how do we define what we're talking about so we're most effective in integration. I mean. I'm in. Jo John Klein, Johnson Controls. Congratulations on the establishment of a, a training pipeline that, that is under your command. And I wonder if in that training pipeline you have OT, an OT curriculum to train your officers as they go and take command of maritime operation centers, understanding the OT part of the network that is going to be organic to those mocks. And is that an opportunity to have some maybe co-training with the Navy Civil Engineer Corps. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, I don't think we specifically have an OT focus yet, but I would agree with you that I think, um, like everything, we need to continue to look at, yeah, what more can we be doing? And especially at the operational level, uh, I think we are still trying to coalesce around uh, what are the what training and training requirements are we missing? How do we do better um, at the integrated level uh, for op the operational? forces, also at the tactical, and then the bridging between the two. Uh, and we've learned lessons, I think, from every event that we've, uh, we've done in terms of where we're going. So I think that's another one that we'll, uh, we'll that
hopefully someone on my team is writing down and we will take and, uh, uh, and look at. But I, we, I don't think we have any th anything specific on that right now. Hi, ma'am. Major Kao, uh, Space Force. Um, question for you, kind of a follow-on to that pipeline. Can you talk a little bit about the way ahead for Space uh, Force-related uh, training, uh, specifically your maritime space officers? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we uh, established the maritime space officer designator last year, uh, and we now have, I think, 45 maritime space officers. We've, uh, I think, done three rounds of selection, uh, and we have another one upcoming where we hope to select some more. We're, we uh, think we're going to have about 90 billets, and that's at the lieutenant commander to captain level. For us, MSO is an uh, on ramp, you know, as a late lieutenant, early lieutenant commander. And we are going to be uh, rolling out uh, training curriculum uh, at NSSI. We partnered uh, uh, with them in Colorado Springs where we will have a maritime space course uh, that most of our MSOs will go through. I think there'll be some judgment based on their background, experience, and the, the rank at which they come over. Uh, but the intent would be to send them through and then the other services are actually going to participate in that course. So that will extend uh, maritime awareness, maritime experience to Space Force itself, uh, the Marine Corps, other services. Uh, so I think we're on a good path there. I think it's an eight week course is what we're piloting and we're excited about that. Um, and then yeah, certainly excited about where we are with MSO right now. Um, but congratulations on being a Space Force uh, person. That's awesome. <laughs> Well, I want to thank everybody for, uh, for the time today, and uh, I just encourage you to attend the other uh, pavilion events, and uh, we will be around here on the floor, so I uh, look forward to, uh, to talking to all of you more uh, as the event progresses. Thanks. Thank you, Admiral. Uh, we're going to reconvene at 1115 for Admiral Perrette. For our media colleagues that are going to have the media roundtable with Admiral Ashback, uh, Josh is standing right there with his hand up. He'll get you in the right spot at the right time. Thank you.